The Vice Lectureship takes its name from a woman who was much beloved in our School of Nursing. She led the school during an important time in its history, and one of my alums just mentioned that she had the most beautiful eyes. I wish I'd gotten to know her. From all accounts, Zula Mae Baber Weiss was thoughtful, warm, and very accomplished. She received her diploma from the School of Nursing, and she later served it with distinction as a nurse, nursing supervisor, educator, and administrator. She's remembered for and admired for her intelligence, vision, and integrity, and she was a key player in developing the School of Nursing into one of now 11 autonomous schools at the University of Virginia. The school has held this vice lecture in conjunction with the Medical Center Hour for, for quite a long time, but today's speaker is particularly well suited to address both nurses and physicians. She's already spent much time with us here at the University of Virginia, and we're thrilled to have this opportunity to invite her back. She's also a dear friend. Since last year, Maddie Schmidt has served as a consultant to us as we launched our interprofessional education initiative. And just to let you know, one of the exciting things that we are doing here is interprofessional education, our new initiative. Stephen Dukoski and I, the Dean of Medicine, he would be here standing with me today, but I know he's on travel. He and I started together in August, and I wrote to him when he was still at the University of Pittsburgh in July when we were both announced. And I said, I'm looking forward to being your colleague, and I hope you're interested in interprofessional collaboration. And he wrote right back, well, I married a nurse, so I'm very interested. And I wrote back to him, well, I'm talking about other things as well. <laughs> That's good news. That's a good start. That's a good start, Stephen. So we have been wonderful colleagues together. We've been all over the state of Virginia, nursing and medicine standing together with our alum. And it's really, I think it's a, it's a new day. It's a new day. So on to, um, uh, I just want to acknowledge our interprofessional team that he and I have put together. Um, it's Dr. Tina Brashears from the School of Nursing side, um, as well as Dorothy Tolman and Susie Burns have helped co-chair it. And the other co-chairs for School of Medicine, because we're all equal partners in this, are um, Terry Saunders and Dr. Christine Peterson. Everybody's here today. The other folks that are on this committee, I'm not going to mention their names because they're on Maddie's slide, but we have nursing, medical students, and faculty from each, from each side, so we're equal opportunity here. Dr. Schmidt has extensive experience as an educator and a researcher in interprofessional collaborative practice models as well as in a professional education. She studied collaborative practice of geriatric health care teams, collaborative decision making in ICU settings, dear to my heart, and palliative care teams in hospital environments. She's one of two U.S. members for the International World Health Organization Study Group on IPE and Collaborative Practice, and they drafted the new World Health Organization Framework for Interprofessional um, Education, and this is scheduled to be released later this year. There is no one better position today to guide us in the challenges of integrating interprofessional education into our curriculum, and no one better to help us explore and ponder the question that she has posed to us today, why interprofessional education and why now? So Maddie Schmidt, please come on up. Please join me in welcoming. Thank you. 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 Thank you
having addressed why IPE at all, why now? And you'll see several bullet points that I want to talk about there. Practice expectations, evidence and pedagogy, global context, and our new national momentum in this area. I want to talk to you a little bit about a few of the current challenges and then end with um, a bit of a uh, preview into the Virginia context for your professional education. So let's start with the definition. What is interprofessional education? Here's a definition that's rather widely accepted now. Uh, it is a definition that comes out of the Center for the Advancement of Interprofessional Education in the UK. It is formal or planned occasions when two or more professions learn with, from, and about each other. Uh, the key components here are probably from and about because we all know the experiences learning with, side by side, in a classroom, uh, common content, which is an important part of what we do because a lot of what we learn across the health professions is content in common and we can do that more efficiently if we learn it together. But the important part of interprofessional is the interactive part learning from each other and learning about each other. Why would we want to do that? Why interprofessional education? Here's the rest of that definition. We learn with, from, and about each other to improve collaboration and quality of care. It is all about good practice. Now, interestingly, in the United States, on the practice side, we have rediscovered over and over how important it is to work together from the late 1940s to the present day. We started to learn this in rehabilitation back in the late 1940s. The first review, a systematic review of studies about the impact of team delivery of care was by a rehabilitation physician, Laurel Halstead, back in the late 1970s. But then we relearned the lesson in primary care, in rural care, in mental health care, in geriatrics, in critical care, in hospice and palliative care, in chronic care, and now in patient safety, quality, and cost of care. You would think that we would get the idea, right? <laughs> Here's what interprofessional practice is at its best. And this is a quote from the Institute of Medicine and Health, Education, Health Professions Education Report in 2003. It's the integration of observations, bodies of expertise, and spheres of decision making to coordinate, collaborate, and communicate with one another across professions in order to optimize care for a patient or a group of patients. And that's the lesson that we learn over and over in practice. What have been the practice drivers for those lessons? First, the need for comprehensive care of the people that we take care of. Access to care for the underserved. Professional workforce shortages and complex system issues. Teamwork and safety uh, processes and systems of care uh, as well as quality and cost. But what really has captured all of our attention in the current era, era is all of the medical era. And the recognition that teamwork and other processes of care contribute greatly to that era. So here we have a picture. The question is, how does what we might do on the education side go with what we've already learned on the practice side? From an educational point of view, <clears throat> I think we're coming to understand that what we want to be able to do is enhance learner outcomes such that we prepare people uh, ready to do collaborative practice. And on the practice side, we all know there are initiatives um, <clears throat> infusing practice these days to enhance patient outcomes. And that's all about learning to work together better. But there's a hypothesis here that's relatively untested. It's if we teach people together, will they practice better together? 
And this is untested because we really have not developed the interprofessional education side of this picture yet. Let's do a little history. Those of you who are a lot younger than I am will not know this, this part of the story. But there are a few of us in the audience who were there then. Um, the initial efforts to do interprofessional education in the United States um, actually started with practice education models for family health care. And these are physician names that you may have read about. Um, Martin Cherkasky, Henry Silver, Deicher and Baldwin, in various parts of the country in the late 50s and into the 60s, who were delivering care in a collaborative way and beginning to teach students together in family health clinics. And then Henry Silver collaborated with Loretta Ford to create the nurse practitioner role, which isn't usually identified um, with the history of interprofessional education, but I think is one of the profound outcomes of that early history. Some of you will not know that there was a report before 2003. It was called Educating for the Health Team. It was chaired, it was an IOM committee chaired by Edmund Pellegrino. And um, I have to look up here because this is off the slide down here. Uh, there were three points made in this report that are interesting to reflect on more than 35 years later. First, mm, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, first, they made the point that there was an administrative obligation to engage in interprofessional education. Uh, second, that we already knew that um, clinical settings were the most important place for learning how to work together. Finally, they announced that at the national level, there was a need for governmental and professional support for interprofessional education uh, for learning to practice in healthcare teams. Now remember, this was 1972-1974. A second report came out 30 years later out of the Institute of Medicine Summit on Health Professions called Health Professions Education a Bridge to Quality. In that report, they said, all health professionals should be educated to deliver patient-centered care as members of an interdisciplinary team emphasizing evidence-based practice, quality improvement approaches, and informatics. What happened in 30 years? <laughs> Well, let me tell you a bit about what happened in that 30-year interval. First of all, we saw a lot of federal support develop for, well, a lot. I guess that's a relative term. It wasn't a lot in big money terms, but it was coming from nowhere into investing in interprofessional education. Starting in the 1970s, there was federal legislative authority to fund targeted interprofessional education demonstration projects through BRSA, the Bureau of Health Manpower. What we saw happen during that period was increased funding for allied health disciplines, the development of AHECs, federal health profession special project grants. Uh, there were 16 grants in the first go-round, and these folks became early institutional leaders in interprofessional education. And in 1974, David Kinde created the Office of Interdisciplinary Programs within the Bureau of Health Manpower. In the 1980s, we saw the development of geriatric education centers, rural training programs, first called ICSRA, and then they became the Quentin Burdick Program. We saw in 1998 the establishment of the Health and Human Service Secretary's Student Award for Interdisciplinary Innovations in Health. But the sad story is that most of this funding went away during the last administration and is only currently being restored. AX did hang on because they had a strong national lobby, they had their own organization, but most of the other programs were zero budgeted. Um, and you know why they were zero budgeted? Because um, they instituted a new evaluative algorithm that said if you couldn't show that these interprofessional programs impacted patient outcomes than they weren't worth investing in. Uh, remember that hypothesis I told you about? 
um, and what learning objectives are or educational <coughs> initiatives. This was a standard that was inappropriate, frankly. But what it led to was they were budgeting most of those programs. Uh, what about other things that happened during that 30-year period? Here's some really a small number of highlights. In 1972, Indiana University, created, Indiana University created a prototype for the later American Medical Student Association Summer Student Interdisciplinary Care Delivery Experiences. Um, DeWitt Baldwin, uh, a physician who is now, I don't think he mind my saying, he's 87 years old and he's in a full-time position at the ACGME. Uh, in those days, uh, the University of Nevada, Reno was a new um, health sciences campus and uh, Dr. Baldwin and his colleagues created a two-year curriculum that was pre-health professional in which any student um, go in a trajectory towards any health profession had two years of common content. We have yet to replicate that long lived experience at the University of Nevada. At the University of Kentucky, they created something called Kentucky January, where groups of interprofessional students went off um, to rural areas and delivered care together during the January break. In 1973, the Ohio State University uh, <coughs> the, created the Interstate Commission on IPE and IPP. That's one of the longest lived university structures for fostering interprofessional education. It still exists today. And they hosted the Banks Conference on Education for Rural Care Delivery. So you see there was a lot of interest in rural care issues. Um, some other developments before uh, David Kennedy went to HRSA, he had created for a short time with Joe Ivy Beaufort the Institute for Health Team Development. And the first team training manual by Ruben Hubnick and Fry at MIT came out in 1975 and it was called Improving the Coordination of Care, a Program for Health Team Development. What's fascinating about this is currently high priority on the National Quality Forum agenda is the topic of coordination of care. Because we know from all the IOM reports that that's one place where poor ability to work together plays out in disastrous ways for our patients. In 1979, the Veterans Administration created something they called the Interdisciplinary Team Training and Geriatrics Program. The VA system has been um, a, a long time a sort of experimenter and, and committed system to interprofessional education. They started out in geriatrics, uh, they put in place 12 team trainers uh, in uh, 12 different institutions, but they became resources for the entire system in team training. And you can fast forward that um, agenda within the VA now to um, primary care and home-based primary care for very ill veterans, which is very, very <coughs> professional. Um, there was also an early national network uh, of folks who met for over two decades, beginning with the Snowbird Conference in 1979, again initiated by Dr. Baldwin and his colleagues. Uh, and this conference reached out as each of those waves came along. And we got um, the VA system doing interprofessional education. And then the Hartford Foundation funded a lot of geriatric training. And so with each wave, we would pick up people and we would engage them in the dialogue and the development of uh, what we were all learning together about interprofessional education and education research. That conference um, ended shortly uh, after the millennium and um, other things have happened. All right, so now we're in a new era, starting in the late 1990s, and I'm going to have to really pick up here. Uh, we've had a resurgence of interest in interprofessional education. Uh, part of that was spurred by a series of health professions education reports that said we need to transform the education of health professionals and interprofessional education is an important part of this. We all know about the Institute of Medicine reports. Starting in 1998 actually with the President's Commission on Quality of Care and then uh, moving to the Institute of Medicine reports, 
uh, calling our attention to the safety, quality, and cost issues in healthcare with an emphasis on system redesign and improved interprofessional teamwork and care coordination. That led to the IOM conference and report that I've already referred to. But in that 2003 report, they identified five core competencies for all health professionals. And you see the one I've underlined, interdisciplinary teams. But the five core competencies actually work together very well. All right, so why IPE now? First of all, I had fun in incorporating these optical illusions into the talk because you know how optical illusions work? You see one side of the picture and you don't see the other side for a long time and then suddenly you see it and you can never not see it again. Well, this is one way I thought we, I, I could express the fact that, and I just chose three health professions to put up here, it could be any combination, that if you look at this one way, we're all separate. But then there's that invisible triangle that connects us. And that invisible triangle is the, is the processes of care that connect us around the safety agenda. It's the other side of the picture that until not too long ago, we didn't see. Here's another one of, version of that that I liked a lot. We're all part of a whole kiwi. Um, I wanted to put up here, um, and I'm not going to go through these in detail because they're in your reference handout, uh, but just to let you know that on the practice side, we now have a lot of systematic reviews that speak to the importance of um, working together in terms of patient outcomes and how when we really change the ways we work together, we can make big differences in outcomes of care. Um, now, you should have gotten the message by now that uh, one of the reasons to do interprofessional education now is that we are getting a big push from practice. Practice has already changed because of the safety agenda. There's lots and lots of work-based interprofessional learning going on to address the needs that we know we have and care. But on the education side, we've been dragging our feet. And so what happened in 2005 to keep that 2003 report alive is JACO, between 2003 and 2005, commissioned a white paper and pulled together healthcare administration, medicine, nursing, and pharmacy to produce a white paper that said, essentially, look, we all need to do this together, not just educators and practitioners, but accreditors, licensing bodies, um, this involves everybody, and they sponsored a conference in September 2005 called Transforming Health Professions Education, Core Competencies, Microsystems, and New Training Venues. And they brought together in one conference educators, practitioners, licensing bodies, accrediting bodies, and said, basically, you all need to get your act together. So. Um, practice expectations is a very important reason for why now. A second one is that the science of interprofessional education is rapidly developing. Back in the early cycle, we all learned together and we generated some really uh, useful uh, lessons. Uh, we learned quite a bit about how to do interprofessional education, but then most of us in this country forgot that we actually ever did that. Um, but other people haven't forgotten. And our international colleagues, because this is a global issue, have been busy developing the science of interprofessional education. And you know what? Um, there was a, an eight-year review, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more in a minute, um, that mined the best literature in interprofessional education. It was a British team. And over 50% of the best articles in interprofessional education were from that early period in the United States. Uh, that came as a great shock to people in the United States, by the way. <laughs> uh, so here's a, a series of reports, uh, some books uh, there on your reference list, that um, are reviews of what we now know about the positive outcomes of interprofessional education. And there's that joint evaluation team that I mentioned and the statistic that 54% of the higher quality studies included in their analysis were U.S. in origin. 
There's a series of books uh, published by Blackwell Press in 2005. You don't see the first one here, but it's on your list. It's called The Case for Collaboration. It was followed by uh, Effective Interprofessional Education Argument, Assumption, and Evidence. And that um, document has been updated in 2007 in an article in Medical Teacher. And then there's a third volume that really focuses on essentially how to do it and how to evaluate it. And then we have a series of Cochrane systematic reviews which are slowly developing. Uh, Merrick Swearenstein, a physician who's now at the University of Toronto, and Scott Reeves, who's a sociologist, and their colleagues have been committed to periodically mining the literature from Cochrane standards perspective and seeing how this literature is slowly developing in that very strict uh, sense of what is a good study. Um, all right, let me talk a little bit about interprofessional uh, education and the notion of unity in diversity. Uh, the unity is that there are some fundamental principles and competencies, but there are a myriad of approaches based on goals and levels of education and training context for how we all learn uh, to work together. Basic elements of interprofessional education, a common ethical framework, knowledge, attitudes, and skills, and teamwork training, that collaboration readiness. Let's talk a bit about the interprofessional ethical framework, because I think um, the IOM report of 2003 talks a lot about competencies, but it misses this fundamental level of understanding that infuses our commitment to work together. Ethic, a, a common ethical framework for us to move forward together with involves shared values in healthcare, knowing that we are all working together for the common good, that we share the same standards for outcomes of the people we care for, that we have mutual obligations to each other in that enterprise that those shared values and mutual obligations get expressed in societal values, in professional codes of ethics, in organizational and educational mission statements, and in personal values. The problem with professional values is that values specific to a profession are often exclusive, and that values are confused with value as in worth. Here's a quote that I like very much from my colleague Hugh Barr in the UK um, in the 2005 volume. The common learning, learning about valuing differences. The common learning ethos exerts pressure to reconcile values as the parties find common cause. But comparative learning argues sometimes for honest acknowledgement of differences to be reconciled, at other times to be tolerated, and for it to be built into the learning when helpful. The danger lies in overlooking the powerful influence of values and in denying or fudging differences. This is not an enterprise about making us all homogeneous. It's about honoring and respecting our differences because that's what the power of working together is about. What is IP in a professional education? Uh, the knowledge that needs to uh, be shared with students is process-oriented and relationship-focused about own role, other health team members' role, training and capabilities, <coughs> principles of communication and teamwork, conflict resolution approaches, systems, small and large, and interprofessional process improvement approaches. So there's a body of knowledge there, and it's grown quite rapidly. And most of the time, our students don't spend much time with this kind of learning. We were just talking at a, a brief luncheon before um, the lecture uh, about how fundamental uh, knowing the other's role and training is and how little we know about that. And you can't get very far down the road without knowing something about who your colleagues are. But somehow, we still are producing students out of our health profession schools. I remember hearing a report from a panel at um, 
one of the Midwestern universities where nurses, uh, nursing students and medical students were talking for the first time in a panel as they were about to graduate. And they said, this is the first time we've ever talked to each other and talked together. I wanted to say something about the notion of teams because there's a difference between teams and teamwork. And even the 2003 report talks the team language. Somehow we think it's about learning to work in teams, okay? And it is partly about that. But teams, in, and this has really come from my own research over time, teams are one way that we deliver care together. And there are appropriate places for teams small groups of people who work together over time, who care for a cohort of patients. But you know what, that's a very restrictive way of what we need to know, uh, uh, and of teaching what we need to know. Teamwork is something else. Teamwork is a broader idea of learning to work together. And uh, over time, I've developed this little um, way of expressing what, for me, learning about teamwork is. Uh, because we've done some research in each of these um, uh, areas. Learning to work together is first about learning to cooperate. And there are some conditions for cooperation. One of the studies that we did was interviewing uh, nurses and um, ICU residents about how they understood the term of collaboration. And what came out of that research was the, was the cooperative behaviors that we need to learn as baseline for even beginning to work together. And there are certain kinds of communication processes that go with um, being cooperative. Then you can step up to uh, an area that we're all very worried about, coordination. Coordination is a different kind of communication work with each other. And it's complicated. It's about timing. It's about sequencing. It's about accuracy of information. It's about a lot of things about how we position ourselves and our work in relation to each other and getting that timing and sequencing right. And all the communication that goes on to make that happen. Finally, there's, uh, and you see the word collaboration all over the literature uncritically, I think there's a narrower understanding of collaboration and it's it's a very high level kind of communication that we do together when we have difficult problems to solve and we don't know the answer. And the collective wisdom of sharing what we all the pieces that we know and sharing that together is going to give us insights into solving those problems, those clinical problems that we wouldn't have otherwise. And so you can see there's, there is a whole hierarchy of learning here that, that can happen whether you're in a little team or not. Um, it goes on every day, all the time in our practice environments. Learning to cooperate, learning to coordinate, learning to collaborate together, whether or not we're in that same small group of people that we work together over time. The insight for me came when I had a, a doctoral student who um, wanted to study collaboration in healthcare, and she was an ICU nurse. And she said, you know, in that setting, the team changes around every patient. I've got to learn how to think about this in a way, unlike the way I had been studying intact teams. Uh, I need a different way of thinking about this. And she uh, finally identified that she was going to study collaborative decision making in the ICU. Um, and posed the question, does the degree of collaborative uh, of collaboration in the, in the decision to discharge impact on mortality and readmission? And the answer was yes. And that study was replicated with NIH funding. But it's a different way of thinking about how we do this work together. Collaborative decision making. So um, I think we have to get over the notion that it's all about teams because teams are very complicated structures and it's about work groups and you know they're work groups of people who work well together, work groups of people who don't work so well together and when they're together in a team 
Uh, it's very complicated structure to maintain, and all the time we've got members moving in and out, right? So if you establish a culture and a way of working together, suddenly a key team member is gone and you have to recreate some of that all over again. So learning fundamental ways of uh, how we uh, deliver care together is going to translate across whatever modality or whatever form of care we're delivering care in. All right, what about the pedagogy of interprofessional education? Something that um, probably from a student perspective and actually most faculty perspectives is, oh, how huh, boring. Um, but we, we're learning a lot more about how to do effective interprofessional education, and a lot of this draws from educational, uh, from adult educational principles. Uh, there are some that are specific to interprofessional education, but a lot of it comes from what we know about effective adult education. Here are some of the things to think about. The leveling, timing, and sequencing of interprofessional training. How you combine didactic and experiential learning. We already know that experiential learning is where the most powerful learning occurs. But that didactic is an important component of this. That the learning is both education-based and practice-based. That it's active <coughs> learning, it's problem-based learning, it involves reflective learning, situated learning, and self-directed learning. So all of these types of learning are extremely relevant in the interprofessional education context. Let me give you a few examples of how this might go together. Let's say our first goal is, <coughs> is to increase the knowledge base. Okay? How, how might we go about that? Here are some things that I know people already do. On the didactic side, studying codes of ethics, examining personal stereotypes through reflected activities, looking at socio-political, professional, and organizational contexts for working together. Let's translate that to the experiential side. And um, this is something that um, inter health profession students do at the University of British Columbia. Talking to young people as a group of health profession students about their different roles. They go out to high school and grammar school students, and they talk to them about health careers. And they describe how they're different from each other, but how they're all engaged in a common enterprise. Interviewing persons from other professions. A powerful exercise that we did in a doctor of nursing practice uh, course that's up and running at Rochester now, when we asked uh, mid-career nurse, uh, nurse practitioners to go interview a health profession professional that they thought they knew little about. We chose speech therapy, physical therapy, social work, one nurse chose a physician. I told the story at lunch. Chose a physician, and she said, when she brought up the experience, she said, I, I imagined what the responses were going to be, and in every instance, I was wrong. Um, so, um, and then finally, shadowing and engaging in the work of um, another health professional. In England now, in one of the large hospital settings in London, in um, the ICU resident rotation, they've instituted a day where the resident takes on the role of working with the nurse in the nurse's activities. Not just shadowing, but actually engaging in the work together. And they have found the experience so powerful, it's now a requirement. Um, all right, let's add skills to the knowledge because each, you know, we're adding skills, but we're continuing learning of that, increasing that knowledge base, right? So on the didactic side, uh, learning uh, skills of working together, <coughs> reading about basic theories and principles of teamwork, observing role models in practice, quality improvement approaches to team meetings and care, use of team steps and other electronic educational resources. So beginning to increase um, information about what are the skills that I need. On the experiential side, teamwork exercises and games, games that deal with things like communication distortion, cooperation, handoffs and coordination, and doing them in a time-limited way. Problem-based team competitions. The Clarion Competition is a student-run competition at the University of Minnesota that now engages health profession students from many uh, campuses across the country where they uh, do a team competition around a case um, and how they work together to come up with uh, plans for care is evaluated by faculty, interprofessional faculty teams. It's 
caught the attention of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and uh, they now feature a lot of that work at the National Forum. Simulation exercise is very important and getting a lot of attention these days. Even things like, uh, I've heard people talk about second life, fa second life families. Uh, having a family out there on the internet that you learn to care for together. All right, now let's add patient and community health outcomes to the knowledge and skills base. And in a lot of places, um, uh, in, in the, um, outside of the United States, there are things that, 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 that have developed that are called training wards, where they bring the health profession students together in an actual patient ward, and with faculty, they learn together to deliver care. In the U.S., you more you commonly seen thing, see things like student-run clinics. Uh, Student-led or practitioner-led organizational community needs assessment, process, and health improvement projects out in the community. Um, I want to say, um, and I'm going to have to try to wrap this up within seven minutes. It's a good thing the clock is up there. Um, I want to say something more about the science of interprofessional education as it's developing, because this is a very rapid development. We are now seeing the introduction of uh, literature about theories beyond traditional adult learning. And I have one of those recent articles on your reference list by Joan Sargent, who is at, the, um, at Duluth University in Canada. I think it's a very compelling article about theoretical underpinnings for the process learning that we need to do together. Competencies are being rapidly developed. An Australian team, as part of the WHO um, update report that um, uh, Dean Fontaine referred to, did a comprehensive review of the competencies literature in interprofessional education and developed a paper that is an appendix to that WHO report and that I think will be in the literature soon, if not already. Evaluative tools. We're making very rapid, rapid progress in understanding how we evaluate these kinds of experiences. Uh, there's a volume that was produced by um, colleagues uh, in the VA system a few years back um, compiling all of the tools that they used in uh, interprofessional training in the VA system and beyond. Um, and that's published as a Kluwer book. Um, there's a, a website uh, at the Canadian Interprofessional Health Collaborative where they have put up all of the tools that they're using for all of their funded interprofessional education initiatives across the country. And, and it's open access. You can go and see what they're using. And we finally woken up that faculty development is a big part of this picture, that learning to teach interprofessionally is something different. And it's also very energizing and very rewarding. Um, but we need to do work in faculty development to learn to teach together and be role models together in that teaching. Here's what I think is our challenge. Learning as participation is not simply a way of acquiring skills, but also of developing an identity and sense of belonging in a community. There you see those silos that we've created on the educational side, the professional self developed in those silos. And what we are about in transforming health professions education is <coughs> discovering that our self has an interprofessional piece. Learning how to develop that is, 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 uh, is learning that takes us out of those silos. Here's another optical illusion. This is the intertwining of care processes and clinical care. Remember I said till the safety agenda appeared what we saw was, and what we taught, was clinical care. What we also need to teach is processes of care, and they are so intimately intertwined that whether you see one or the other, you eventually need to see both. Why IPE now? We've talked about practice expectations. We've talked about the science of IPE rapidly developing. There's a global context to this conversation. And this is just a glimpse into that global context across national networks. Um, who has already been mentioned? 
Um, they had a 1988 statement on interprofessional education, and there's now an update of that um, that includes interprofessional practice uh, actually winding its way through the last committees at WHO headquarters in Geneva. It was completed about a year ago, and we're hoping that it will be released very soon. There is a journal devoted to the pedagogy of interprofessional education, and it's been around for quite a long time. <coughs> And it's a great resource for sharing internationally the learning that we're, um, we're gaining from our interprofessional education experiences. There are global conferences that occur every other year now called All Together Better Health Conferences, where the agenda is talking about how we uh, learn together for the improvement of care. The fourth one was in Stockholm last year, and the fifth one will be in Sydney this coming April. We now have Collaborating Across Borders Conference. This is a dialogue about interprofessional education between Canada and the United States. And there's a long story about how that came about, but uh, interprofessional work in Canada has been funded by Health Canada um, by millions and millions of dollars, and they also funded an umbrella organization that allowed interprofessional education projects in different universities to come together and share learning. Um, and so they have really fast forwarded a lot of what we know about how to do effective interprofessional education. On the practice side, they funded a huge primary care transition project where interprofessional primary care models were um, the agenda, figuring out how we transform primary care uh, from an interprofessional perspective. The next Collaborating Across Borders Conference, and this is a plug, um, we just had uh, the second one in Halifax at last May. The first one was in Minnesota. The third one will be in 2011, uh, hosted by the Arizona Telemedicine Program in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, and the, top, the theme of the conference will be technologies in interprofessional education. And the new Telehealth Institute there just opened. <coughs> well, it's been open a while, but it was just des des dedicated about two weeks ago. Then there are all these abbreviations. The European Interprofessional Network, the Australian Interprofessional Network, the Japan Interprofessional Network. NIPNET is a Scandinavian Interprofessional Network. And then there's CAPE that I've already mentioned in the UK, the Canadian Interprofessional Health Collaborative, and that network in the US is coming back, and it's called the American Interprofessional Health Collaborative, and it's in formative stages. So why IPE now? The last point I want to make <coughs> is in the U.S. Educational Momentum for IPE and Health Professions Education Programs, accreditation changes, and continuing professional development are all happening as we speak. Um, so we have regained momentum in the U.S., and we are now um, heavily and broadly in ways that we would have never imagined in that first cycle uh, about the enterprise of transforming interprofessional education. Uh, we have some problems to address. Currently, these efforts in the U.S. are scattered and unconnected, from high-level change to discrete institutional initiatives. And one of the fun things about coming to Virginia and um, discovering um, that you had a lack of awareness of a lot of this going on, was to say, you don't have to do this alone. My goodness, there's so-and-so uh, and so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so over there, and they're working on the same problems, and you know what, you could work on this together. So we have a lack of awareness of existing evidence, best practices, and we have to avoid reinventing the wheel. We have to get around the idea that interprofessional education is all about add-on funding, and that it's integral to what we do. Uh, we have uh, a large agenda, in faculty and preceptor development, in integrating the use of technology and an educational evaluation and research. Steve Wartman, who is now the CEO at the Association of Academic Health Centers, calls our research in health professions education a cottage industry. Um, other lessons we need to take home. It's not just about medicine and nursing. That's where you're starting here, but it's not the full picture. There are lots of other health professions out there, and there are people beyond the health professions who are important in helping us deliver good quality care. We need to link our educational efforts to practice needs and models, and I've underlined this because I'm going to show you a slide in a minute about that. 
We need to address the notion of health professional versus health worker because those non-professional workers are a critical part of so much of what we do by way of bringing quality of care to our patients. And we need to recognize that it's not all about safety. Safety has brought us back, but those old problems of access to care, shortages, workforce shortages, and comprehensive care are there as much as they were 30 years ago. All right, thinking strategically, how do we, does IPE link with diverse IPE practice models? And I'm not going to go through this list, but you can see here is a whole array of things on the practice side where interprofessional is already integral. And all we need to do is find ways to connect our educational initiatives to these things, these, these models that are already out there in practice. Here's another slide. We have a lot more of them. Um, all right, now finally, IPE at the University of Virginia. You've already heard that I've had the privilege of being a consultant here since February of this year on a new IPE initiative that started then. Uh, when I came, I discovered a base of ongoing interprofessional education here, and you know what? People who were doing a little interprofessional project over here at Virginia and a little interprofessional project over here at Virginia didn't know about each other. Um, so um, the exercise of just putting on paper what are all the things already going on has become an exercise in disability and awareness. Um, and um, <coughs> last February, you've already heard that uh, Dean Spontane and Dukoski initiated this interprofessional education IPEI initiative. What have they done? Oh, who are they, first of all? They're School of Medicine and School of Nursing faculty members, administrators, students, telemedicine center faculty. There are four work groups. The work groups have been, and this is changing, I mean, you fit the structure to what the tasks are. Building what is and new proposals, chaired by Tina Brashears. Marketing, chaired by Dorothy Tolman. Grant proposal development, chaired by Terry Saunders, who's sitting right here. And administrative and development by Christine Peterson. As that Dean Fontaine pointed out, partners from medicine and nursing. What have they done? Developed um, draft vision, mission, and value statements, uh, identified five core competencies, learning objectives that go with those competencies, uh, are working on evolving structures for the IPEI work, developing resources, literature in the field, evaluation tools, surveys of what is in the existing curricula, learning activities that exist already, um, that need to be tied to some interprofessional learning objectives, an inventory of those IPE extracurricular projects that are so exciting to students, evaluating and supporting new opportunities, and they are bubbling up everywhere. People have wonderful ideas for um, how to do this in their own work, developing a major grant proposal, and making IPE at UVA visible through a visual image of the initiative, quotes a logo, and I hear that the winner of that contest is going to be announced at the reception. Uh, gathering interprofessional student stories so that they can be shared in all kinds of venues. Articles, there's, um, uh, it's not quite out, but the Fall Legacy, which is the alumni magazine in the School of Nursing, has a big feature story on the work I'm going here in Virginia with uh, Deans Dukoski and Fontaine on the cover. And finally, today's lecture. So they have been busy. This is since February. And here are some of the things that I discovered were going on here. Um, international interprofessional work. Guatemala, the J-Term, Global Health Partnership Program. International is interprofessional, but we don't often recognize it as such. And there are great opportunities here. And there are lots of lessons that apply in our own underserved areas. The bioinnovations course, there's a story here. I discovered that, that nursing, medicine, architecture, engineering, and business were teaching a course together on innovations, uh, technological innovations, space design. And when I came in February, I was going to be participating in a conference in the end of March with seven institutions around the country where this kind of work was being developed and they were going to be together for the first time to review a curriculum focused on interprofessional healthcare space design. And I said, the Virginia team needs to be there, and they were. 
they got there and they now have a network of colleagues around the country who are sharing in this kind of vision. Uh, remote area medicine, um, another uh, outreach to underserved communities, again, uh, a health profession students working together, energized by this work together, but not really thought of in interprofessional terms in the pedagogy ways we've been talking about. And the transitions course, learning basic clinical skills together. What an innovative idea that is. You know, when I came, I said, there are, there is interprofessional work going on here that is not duplicated anywhere else. The bioinnovations course is way out there on the cutting edge. This course, as far as I know, is not duplicated anywhere else in the country, and it is powerful. So you are already on the cutting edge, whether you know it or not. This is the vision that across the lifelong learning trajectory that we start, at the undergraduate level with a core piece. Now, all that other circle is all of our disciplinary learning, right? All of our individual health professions learning. But that IPE starts at the undergraduate level, continues at the graduate level, continues in formal CE, and is manifested in work-based CE, which is already ongoing in large measure. Thank you for your time. It's been more than 45 minutes. I'm sorry, but I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope it's been informative.